welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. Now, as you know, I cover a lot of foreign acts on this show, most of whom turn out to be more popular in their home country than they were here. But a lot of my understanding of music comes from critics based in the UK, and that's affected who I cover. See, there's a ton of British acts who are technically one-hit wonders in this country, but in merry old England, they are not just more successful, they're bona fide superstars. I simply cannot think of acts like these as one-hit wonders, so I have always chosen not to cover them on this show. That changes today. Yes, as one of the requests I got, we are going to be looking at an act that was, for a few years at least, the biggest band in Britain. Well, I don't know the biggest, I wasn't there, but at the very least, they had very few rivals in the early 2000s British pop scene. I am, of course, talking about the one, the only... That's right, S Club 7. Ain't no party like an S-Club party, cause an S-Club party's extremely irritating. You Yanks may not have heard of our band yet. Believe me, you will. <sighs> now, if you're an American and of the right age, you might remember them for their TV show, which ran on the Fox Family Channel for many years. S-Club 7 in Miami, S-Club 7 in Hollywood, and then I think it was S-Club 7 Criminal Intent. I don't remember. As far as I can tell, their show was decently popular here, but it was nothing compared to how big they were back home. Literally every damn one of their singles broke the top five in the UK. But in America, their presence on the pop charts was limited to just this. Do you remember this one? Because I do not. I was in high school and I was way too good for that teeny bopper TRL crap by that point. I was not too good for Matchbox 20, but I was way too good for S Club 7. But I feel like I should at least remember it, and I don't. No memory of this whatsoever. And actually, why would I? It's not a very good song! In fact, I find this entire thing kind of mystifying. Big, proven hitmakers, with the added promotion of a hit show, and yet their only American hit, which scraped in the top 10 in the summer of 2001, was this forgettable nothing ballad. Okay, a dream come true, I guess. All right, let's get this S Club party started. Our story begins in 1998. But the story of S Club 7 is not really that of any of its members. No, their story is the story of this man. You probably don't recognize him. You may or may not recognize his name, Simon Fuller. If you don't, well, guess what? Simon Fuller is maybe the most influential man in popular music of the past 20 years. Yes, it was he who started the television revolution that was Pop Idol quickly exported to every country in the world, and unleashing a whole onslaught of rival talent competitions that clog up the airways to this day. But in 1998, he was still riding high off his first name-making success. The Spice Girls. A pop sensation whose time in the spotlight was actually surprisingly brief, but will forever define British pop music for me. And Simon Fuller was the brains behind the group. He found them, managed them, gave them their identities, and in 1997, was rewarded by being fired by the group. Why? The Spice Girls themselves have never really given a clear reason. Personally, I suspect Spice World was the main factor. Hold on to your knickers, girl! <laughs> yeah, but that's when Fuller got his next idea. A band that had the backing of a sitcom, just like the Monkees. It'd be just like Spice World, except it's on week after week, and it'd be on television instead of film, so it'd be okay it had no budget. He named it the S Club 7. What does the S stand for? The members eventually confirmed it a few years ago. It stands for Simon. He slapped his initials on that band like a pair of designer underwear. And they starred in their TV show for four seasons, plus two TV movies, plus one feature movie in the UK. And I watched all of it. No, I didn't even remotely, but I tried my best. 
It's about being a struggling English band trying to make it in America. Which is funny because they mostly didn't. But here they are. Let me introduce you to Rachel, Bradley, Hannah, Paul, Joe, John, and Tina. Or actually, let me introduce you to them by the character archetypes they played on the show. The dumb one, 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 and the dumb one. I'm sorry, this show rotted my brain. Like, you know how you can watch Shape by the Bell and know who the different characters are, or how you could look at the names of each Spice Girl, or even just look at their outfits and figure out what they represented? I could not do that at all for S Club 7. The only real characters they have is that they're color-coordinated, like the Power Rangers, so, uh... If you like yellow, you were Hannah, I guess. But even though that show is not good, it's really easy to see how influential it was. You can bet that the Disney Corporation was watching this, because that show is the model for every Hillary Duff and Hannah Montana that came after. I don't know if I prefer this or the Disney model, honestly. The BBC does things very differently. It's much less colorful and grubbier, and it doesn't have a laugh track, so it's a lot less memorable, but also less annoying. I'll say this, I enjoyed it a lot more than High School Musical. But the songs, oh, the songs, oh boy. Don't stop, never give up, hold your head high and reach the top, let the world see what you have got. Even in the days of TRL dominance, this is edgeless. It's so chipper. It doesn't even sound 90s. It's a direct recreation of what pop music sounded like in the 70s. It's clearly trying to be the Jackson 5. Bring it all back to you. But it's, it's just too bland. What I remember about Teen Pop in 1999, the, the Max Martin sound, was that it was incredibly forceful and in your face. It's like a tank rolling through your city, unstoppable. And S Club 7 are an entirely different genre. Even when trying to be at their most in your face, they sound so innocent. Like whatever is too kitty for Radio Disney. You'd play this on Nick Jr. Jr., which is weird because every now and then they'll dip into something more adult than they should be, and it hits such a weird note. The mere fact that you call them nanas tells me you're not ready to be talking about them. And that's not even getting into what. Ghetto Boys is supposed to mean. Bush with Bill hiding in the background? I mean, they did get sexed up eventually. They were young, hot people in a world full of UK tabloids. I watched their show, I think I caught a joke about Rachel having giant boobs. Yeah, you're just like Ali McBeal. Except when she looks down, she can see her feet. <laughs> I'm gonna guess that never happened on Victorious. There's also a bit that sticks out to me from when they were trying to learn how to be American. This is a lift. Over here, they call it an elevator. This is Hanson. Over here, they call them talented. Fuck you! Fuck you! How dare you! Hanson became a really good band when they got older. Yeah, I know it was the 90s and everyone clowned on Hanson. Me included. But if there's one group of people who weren't allowed to diss them... I'm just saying. Well, anyway, let's cut to the end of the year 2000. S Club. Uh, yeah. Well, S Club 7 are now an international smash. Hit show across the world, two seasons, two albums, mega successful in the UK, but still no breakthrough in America. They were gonna need a real act of charity to get big. And that's what they got. Million, two hundred and forty-four. The BBC does a charity drive called Children in Need every year, and they release a charity single for it every year too. Sometimes it does well, sometimes it doesn't. That year it was delivered by S Club 7. For never had a dream come true. And go buy this song! And I'm sure they helped a lot of kids. But the real kids who benefited were themselves. It was their dream come true. They might well have called it Never Had a Hit Break America. Not till the day they found this. I never had a dream. This is such a goddamn boring song. I'm not sure what to say here, but here goes. Okay, first point, 
Charity singles suck as a rule. For us Yanks, they were only a thing briefly in the 80s and all attempts to revive them have failed. But the Brits have never gotten over it. They love it more and more every year it seems like. They have them from Children in Need, from Comic Relief, a bunch of one-offs every year. I've heard a bunch and I don't know if there's a good one in them. The live version has a children's choir, too. The Brits must be a really generous people who love giving out of the bottom of their hearts because no one could like these songs. So why was this their only American hit? Well, it fit the American pop scene in a way that all their other songs didn't. Look, the Backstreet Boys and Britney and Christina, they had their big giant Max Martin smashes, and S Club 7 were just not a band who could compete on those terms. But boring ballads? Sure. That was super successful in both countries. You could be a TRL act, or an R&B singer, or a Latin pop star, or a country singer. No matter who you were, you could dip into easy listening and the public would eat it up. And then forget it entirely within a few months. Soppy ballads ruled the airwaves, especially in England. Oh my fucking Christ, England, by the way. What the hell were you guys doing? From what I can tell, British pop was at a serious low point. Shitty ballad after shitty ballad. Awful. This is why no UK pop act crossover for like the entire Bush administration. But yeah, this is, uh, this is as early 2000s as it gets. Got the Spanish guitar in there, which was like the sad residue of the Latin pop craze. But I just don't have anything to grab onto here. When you've got a ballad, you have to have some kind of memorable detail, like a sentiment, a hook, a something. Like, I want it that way. Tell me why. That song's great, and its hook is that it doesn't make any sense. Or my heart will go on. It had the flute, and it had Celine's bulldozing powerhouse voice, but never had a dream come true. There's no use looking back. just don't see what I'm supposed to care about. They're even dressed in all white. They don't even get to wear their colors. That was all the personality they had. Okay, the opening lyric about having to leave someone behind does tug on one heartstring I have. Everybody's got something they had to leave behind. I mean, I kind of like that idea that it was just fate, no one's decision, and there's a lot of regret there. But it kind of shows the problem, too. Everybody's got something. Yeah, everyone's got that someone. It's writing about it like it's a universal experience. And a ballad needs to be personal. Yeah, nothing. My heart remains cold and dead listening to it. I mean, it might just be cold and dead, period. I've lost all sense of time. I'll, I'll give it this, Joe is a good singer, and she's singing it like she means it. She's giving it her all. I mean, look, these kids, they haven't had the joy and life strangle out of them yet, so, you know, that does a lot. I've heard worse is what I'm saying, they're doing their best. Or at least Joe is, I don't know if the rest of them are all that necessary. Are the guys even doing anything on this song? I think they're just lip syncing. Yeah, we're still here. Maybe. Y'all dumb motherfuckers want a key change. Look, I guess the S Club were trying to remake themselves in a more mature direction. But you don't gain maturity just by singing mature songs. And maturity is overrated anyway. As far as I'm concerned, they should have stuck with their original direction. Next! S Club. I'd like that to stop. Well, anyway, here's their next single, Don't Stop Moving. Yeah, come on. Oh, it's, uh, we're going disco, I see. Ain't no disco like an S Club disco. It's got more of a groove, at least. It's kind of like the middle school version of Daft Punk. It's got a good beat. You can dance to it. It's still really, really just for kids. Like... There's nothing that's ever going to give this band any kind of edge. They could sing Megadeth and it'd still sound like the Wiggles. But, you know, I can't complain. It's their aesthetic. Unfortunately, they followed that with another Children in Need ballad, which was even more boring than the first one. But you know what? Those songs both still topped the British charts. 
and all their other singles did well too. I promise you a failed follow-up, so let me give you a failed follow-up. You know how I was talking about Pop Idol earlier? Technically that's not Simon Fuller's first reality show. Because, debuting just one month earlier, we had S Club Search. The quest to find the pre-teen spin-off group to S Club 7. They had a whole docuseries hyping up their arrival before their debut in April of 2002. So let me introduce you to S Club 8. Actually, they were S Club Juniors at first, and then they changed their name to S Club 8. Either way, they sound like the shitty direct-to-video sequel of the original. And honestly, they weren't exactly failed either. For one album at least, it was very brief though. Their second album flopped, their show was cancelled after a season, and they quickly disbanded. Although, a couple of the girls eventually started their own girl group, which became much more successful. And I bring up the juniors because it just reminds me of how mercenary this whole enterprise is. S Club 7 were not a band. They were a franchise. Even other manufactured pop acts look more legit. There was no Backstreet spin-off. NSYNC didn't continue without Justin. Disney didn't slap a wig on some random girl and make her the new Hannah Montana. Meanwhile, here's the Interchangeable 7, not a single one of whom couldn't have been easily replaced, and their boss is trying to launch the S Club Extended Universe. Fuller tried to do something similar in America, by the way. Like child stardom in Fraud Enough. Let's have them compete and pick them off one by one. Ugh. Oh god, it's a mess. Look, the S Club 7 were big their entire existence. They kept having hits. But the S Club machine was getting really shaky. The show was brutal. And I don't mean it was brutally bad, although it was. I mean the schedule. They were trying to be pop stars in Britain and TV actors in America at the same time. That's nuts. Oh, and at some point the show had Hannah and Paul start dating? Woo! <laughs> to be clear, Hannah and Paul started dating in real life, and it got written into the show. To me, that seems like a recipe for goddamn disaster, but it turned out not mattering because Paul quit the band anyway midway through the fourth season. He was gaining weight, he didn't like the attention, and he wanted to make his own music. And as foreshadowed by his awful Limp Biscuit goatee, he started a new metal band which ended up going nowhere. His relationship with Hannah did in fact end pretty ugly, but that came later. And since there weren't seven of them anymore, they renamed themselves just S Club. Or Sclub, as I call them. I kinda wish they'd just become S Club 6 for maximum confusion. And there's too much other stuff. Drugs, injuries, lawsuits. They called it quits in 03. Some of them went on to bigger and better things. Some of them did not. They did do a brief reunion tour in 2015, and there are rumors they're gonna reunite again soon for the 20th anniversary. But the last one didn't seem to go very well, so uh, yeah, maybe it'll happen. Right after that co-headlining tour of the original lineups of Guns N' Roses and Smashing Pumpkins. In America, you mean? Well, how about I put it like this. I think they deserve to have any of their other hits be big, rather than the one that did. I'm not gonna say I like them exactly, but I have had S Club Party and Reach and Don't Stop Moving and Bring It All Back intractably stuck in my brain since I started this episode. They're cheesy. They're really grating. But I see why they're hits. God damn it, they're catchy. Never Had a Dream Come True just slides off my brain. And did they deserve better? Yeah, they deserve better, the same way every child star deserves better than to be ground up and spit out by the pop machine. 